Welcome to the Afghan Eye YouTube channel. If this is your first visit, make sure to subscribe and press the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our new videos. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this episode of the Afghan Eye podcast. This is episode three of season two, and I'm your host, Ahmed Walid Karkar. And in today's episode, like in previous episodes, we'll be covering the major news coming out of Afghanistan, this time dissecting and analyzing a recently convened gathering in Moscow attended by exiled Afghan politicians. What does this gathering mean and what is its significance? Is it significant? Before diving into the topic, however, if you are new to the podcast or to the channel, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you. Please make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and press the notification bar so you don't miss any of our content as it comes out. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, as well as Instagram and all major audio streaming services, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, etc. And if you agree with our cause of Afghans leading the discussion on Afghanistan, you can support us by becoming a patron on our Patreon or through a one-time donation via our PayPal. The links for all of the above will be in the description box. I'd like to thank everyone who's reached out since the launch of season two, all commented, shared, liked and subscribed. In times like this when most of us, including Afghans, are more focused on what's happening in Gaza as opposed to Afghanistan, if you are watching and observing the news coming out of Afghanistan, then you really and truly are an enthusiast. Now, a quick introduction is in order. Like I said, this event was held in Moscow, and it was held in Moscow on the 24th of November 2023, which is three, four days ago. And it was hosted not by the Russian government, but by a Russian justice institution, the Institute for a Just World supported by the Just Russia Party and the Russian Academy of Science. Now, the Just Russia Party is not just Russia as in only Russia, but a just Russia, as in a Russia of justice. Those in attendance at this event included an envoy from the Iranian government, as well as Sergei Mironov, who is the leader of the Just Russia Party. Now, the Afghan politicians attending this event included Fawziya Kufi and Shukriya Barakzai, female Afghan politicians who are often seen as or present themselves as Afghan feminists or as close to feminism as the Afghan political spectrum allows. It also included Muhammad Muhaqiq, the Shia Hazara leader who in recent times was instrumental in facilitating the deployment and the recruitment of the Afghan Fatimi Yun Brigade recruited by Iran to fight for the government of Bashar al-Assad in Syria in which it was implicated in many atrocities. Finally, it included, of course, the Masud family, Ahmad Wali Masud, the brother of Ahmad Shah Masud and Ahmad Masud were also in attendance in this conference. Now, Ahmad Masud is, of course, the leader of the NRF or the National Resistance Front, and they also confirmed his attendance in a tweet. And this is the first or at least the most prominent thing that we're hearing from him since he was reported to have asked Israel for its help against the Taliban. Now, it was controversial then, so controversial, in fact, that his organization, the NRF, subsequently denied and refuted claims that he had said such a thing. But it's aged even more horribly now as we see and witness the ongoing Israeli massacre in Gaza. Now, one of the things that his organization's refutation failed to address, however, was why the Israeli outlet that reported that he had asked Israel for his help would lie. What incentive would they have? After all, Afghanistan is relatively far from Israel, and Ahmad Masoud is not really significant enough for his plea for help to be any sort of game changer as far as Israel's regional calculus and foreign policy goes. In any case, Israel notwithstanding, Ahmad Masoud leveled a few criticisms at the Taliban in this conference in Moscow. The Taliban, Masoud said, had held the people of Afghanistan hostage and had not found a common language with the people of Afghanistan. The Taliban had changed Afghanistan 
into Talibistan, whilst Afghanistan is a country that is not restricted to one ethnicity, political group, or person. Over the past three decades, Masood said, the Taliban have repeatedly rejected attempts at solving differences through negotiations and repeatedly broken their promises. In 2021, they were handed the country in a conspiracy. Now, this isn't what he said verbatim. I am paraphrasing here, and I'll upload the link in, which contains the video in which he said this, which was reported by Afghanistan International. As much as it pains me to share the YouTube links to Afghanistan International's YouTube channel, I also like to think of myself as a fair man, and Afghanistan International actually managed to achieve something remarkable here. They've uploaded this video, and there are no lies, so I will link to that video, so my conscience is not burdened. We have a conference convened in Moscow, not organized by the Russian state or government, however supported by political parties and the Russian Academy of Science, attended by Russian politicians, as well as an Iranian envoy, and of course, fugitive Afghan politicians, all of whom oppose the Taliban, some of them to the extent of military resistance. Now, there are a couple of ways to look at this. There is, of course, the domestic Afghan lens in which we can look and analyze what this means or signifies, if it means or signifies anything in terms of any change in the intra-Afghan political discourse and spectrum. But as evidenced by Masood's speech, which I paraphrase and to which I will link, there's not really much new that's been said here. A lot of the criticisms are essentially things that we've heard quite repeatedly over the past two years, and perhaps you could say the past two decades. The angle from which I do want to approach this issue, however, is what it means, or at least what it signifies and tells us with regard to the relationship between Russia and Afghanistan, between Moscow and Kabul, between the Russian government and the Taliban. And if we do look at it from that perspective, what we'll see here is whilst there is some continuity insofar as Afghan-Russian relations are concerned, it has largely remained underanalyzed and underreported. So since the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan in August 2021, it has had diplomatic relations with Moscow. In fact, it's had diplomatic relations with Moscow even before its takeover, during the time when the Taliban were an armed insurgency fighting against the US occupation and based, politically at least, out of Doha, in Qatar. Since August 2021, what we have seen, however, is whilst there is a relationship between Russia and the Taliban, it's been very much summarized by what we can say in Dari, is the common saying of Duri wa Dosti, friendship, but at a distance. And in the spirit of Duri wa Dosti, or friendship at a distance, what we have seen from Moscow are what could be perceived as mixed signals. Moscow has called on the Taliban to institute a, quote, inclusive government and to take solid measures against terrorism and to respect the rights of women and girls. However, it's also criticized the US for the economic sanctions that it's levied against Afghanistan, called for aid to Afghanistan, conducted trade deals with Afghanistan under the Taliban. So how do we really make sense of all of this? And what Russian officials have been saying about Afghanistan publicly over the past few months. Most importantly, Zamir Kabalov, the Russian special representative to Afghanistan since the Taliban's takeover. So over here on the 16th of June 2023, the Russian special envoy for Afghanistan said in an interview with Russian media outlet RTVI that the current government in Afghanistan is not inclusive. He said that the security situation in Afghanistan has not changed and urged Russian citizens to avoid travel to Afghanistan during the interview. So that is the 16th of June, 2023. That is the Russian special envoy to Afghanistan. On the 28th of September, here is a article from a Russian news outlet in which Kabulov says that Russia may recognize the interim Taliban government in future, but the Taliban will have to earn that recognition and they should show indeed that they are ready to respond to the call for an ethno-political inclusive government. Now bear in mind this is on the 28th of September 2023. Now on the 29th of September 2023, the Moscow format consultations were held on Afghanistan in the Russian city of Kazan, following which 
a declaration was published. Now, interesting because it came out of the Moscow fortnight consultations, which were attended by special representatives and senior officials from China, India, Iran, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Russia, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, as well as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, and Turkey, as well as the Afghan foreign minister. Now, the declaration is interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, it praised the Taliban for their anti daesh campaign. It also praised the Taliban for their poppy ban and their counter-narcotics efforts. It called on the Taliban to step up cooperation with regional countries to, quote, fight against the threats of terrorism, which were not actually mentioned by name. It also called on the Taliban to respect the rights of women and girls. It criticized international attempts to politicize humanitarian assistance and highlighted the importance of continuing humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. At the same time, it regret, and this is a quote, it regretfully stated that there had been no progress in forming a truly inclusive government in Afghanistan, reflecting the interests of all ethno-political groups of the country, despite the appointment of some individual representatives of various Afghan ethnicities, the parties, as in those attending the consultation, observed no political pluralism in it. Now, this is actually something that I had noted in previous episodes of the Afghan Eye podcast, which is that it's entirely true that the Afghan government is not at all inclusive, whether politically or ethnically. And assuming that Kabul one day wants to heed the call internationally to form an ethnically inclusive government, it wouldn't have to go to other political factions to form some sort of coalition or inclusive government. You see, whilst it's true that the Taliban are a Pashtun majority movement political party, and that is reflected in its government and cabinet, there is no shortage of Tajik, Turkmen, and Uzbek Taliban. Assuming that ethnic inclusivity were to be attained, there's no need to go to other factions. All that would have to be done is to promote the number of Tajik, Turkmen, and Uzbek Taliban. And this is what the Kazan Declaration from the Moscow Format Consultation has highlighted, that despite the appointment of some individual representative of various Afghan ethnicities, the parties observed no political pluralism within it. Now this actually relates to something that I had written a while ago with regard to how ethnic inclusivity is manipulated in Afghanistan because you see as the Kazan declaration from the Moscow format consultation highlights it doesn't suffice to have a Farsiwan Talib and a Uzbek Talib and a Hazara Talib and a Turkmen Talib but what suffices is quote political inclusivity in which the Masud family or at least most importantly people like Ahmad Masud can claim to be the representatives of a certain ethno-political grouping which is what Kabulov has referred to. So the short and the long story is is that all of these countries that signed this declaration want a government that is not entirely staffed by the Taliban. Now of course no one is opposed to this declaration's call for an ethnically and politically inclusive government in Afghanistan. But this declaration becomes interesting when we look at who its signatories are. Who is calling for an ethnically and politically inclusive government in Afghanistan? China, a one-party communist state. Iran, a Shia theocracy. Pakistan, which deposed arguably its most popular ever politician and democratically elected prime minister, as well as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the UAE. Do any of those strike you as politically inclusive? Now, on the 12th of October, Zamir Kabulov, once again, the special envoy of Russia to Afghanistan, said that we are more concerned about political inclusivity rather than ethnic inclusivity, which the Taliban insist on. So the Taliban's, if you will, gotcha card of pulling out ethnic minority Taliban is obviously not working here. Kabulov also said that communities in Afghanistan, such as Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks and Turkmens, who are called a minority, collectively make up more than half of the Afghan population. Now, ethnic data, demographic data in Afghanistan is severely limited, which is a symptom of 
four decades of war and prior to that weak central governance but Karbalov giving his opinion and that is exactly what it is an opinion on Afghan demographics for a foreign diplomat is uh, questionable at best in addition to the fact that Karbalov as you've probably guessed from the name, is not an ethnic Russian. He was actually born in Uzbekistan. And whilst his ethnic background is unspecified, it's reasonable to assume that he is an ethnic Uzbek. Is his ethnic background skewing his perception, or is this more broadly a reflection of Moscow's policy toward Afghanistan? Now, just as you start to think that we've got the broader contours of Russian policy with regard to Afghanistan, here is a tweet that throws something of a spanner in the works. Now this tweet is from November the 25th, 2023. Now if you recall, the conference attended by fugitive Afghan politicians opposed to the Taliban in Moscow took place on November 24th. On November the 25th, the Afghan or the Taliban foreign ministry spokesperson tweeted a series of pictures of the Afghan Foreign Minister Mutaqi meeting the Russian ambassador. So, so Moscow's ambassador to Afghanistan went to visit the Afghan Foreign Minister a day after Moscow itself saw a conference attended by fugitive Afghan politicians, all of whom opposed the Taliban. Now the tweet here is from Hafiz Ziya Ahmad, who is a spokesman for the Afghan Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the tweet says, "Nan la garmi makhki pa kabel ki dar Russia Federation safir Dmitry Zhirinov de Emirat Islami Afghanistan Bahraini Uchar Wazir Maulavi Amir Khan Mutaqi Sarawakatal." So today, before the afternoon in Kabul, the Russian Federation's ambassador Dmitry Zhirinov met the Afghan Foreign Minister. The subsequent tweet actually mentions the topics of discussion which included the tweet says in this meeting bilateral political and economic ties between afghanistan and russia were discussed in addition to recent regional and international events as well as discussions relating to education and culture how do we make sense of this the russian federation hosts anti-taliban meetings on its soil whilst maintaining diplomatic ties with the taliban and making semi anti-Taliban speeches, whilst at the same time praising the Taliban for counter-narcotics efforts as well as their fight against Daesh. Like I said, duri wa dosti, friendship but at a distance. It's a carrot and stick approach. We will reward Kabul, the thinking in Moscow seems to be, where and if this is warranted, especially with regard to counter-narcotics or anti-Daesh campaigns. And we will use the stick, which is public statements, hosting anti kabul politicians on its soil in order to prod Kabul to do more of what Moscow wants it to do. And this is probably the oldest method of attempting to shape what we could say is an adversary or a potential adversary's behaviour. Episode 3 of Season 2 of the Afghan Night Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. And you've probably gathered by now that we have something of a quicker format for these podcasts. Number one, they are hosted by myself alone. Number two, they are much shorter than the podcast that we used to do. And number three, these are generally looking at picking up the recent developments and breaking these into two sections. What happened? And secondly, what does this mean? How is it important? Is this important? Please remember to like and subscribe on our YouTube channel and please drop down your comments and let me know your thoughts below. I want to build something of a correspondence with our viewers. Make sure to follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, as well as Instagram. And if you agree with our cause of Afghans leading the discussion, redefining the discussion on Afghanistan, then you can support us by becoming a patron on our Patreon or through a one-time donation on our PayPal. Up until next time, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.